This is Duke University. My name is James Andrews. I am 65 years old. Uh, I am president of the North Carolina State AFL-CIO. I grew up in Warren County, as you've indicated. Um, I grew up on a farm. Um, there was seven of us uh, children and my parents. And for most of my uh, childhood, we always had one or more uh, relatives, uh, young relatives living with us, either my aunt's two kids or uh, my uncle's stepkid, someone staying in the house. We stayed near our grandmother, uh, which was just next door, a couple of cousins, when I said next door, this is in rural North Carolina, so next door could be, you know, a distance away. But in this case, it was actually literally, um, you know, 500 feet away, right? Um, so, uh, as I said, it was the seven of us. Life on the farm was pretty tough. However, when I was five years old, my parents allowed me to go to New Jersey to stay with my uncle, my namesake, James Andrews, my, my uncle. I uh, went to New Jersey, I was enrolled in school up there. I spent a little less than a year. But after the tears and the crying, saying, I wanna go home, my uncle and aunt figured it was time to take me back to Warren County. So the kind of crops we grew uh, would be the next thing I would say. We uh, grew row crops, uh, you know, cotton, tobacco, um, uh, cantaloupes and watermelons was our cash crops, we call. I mean, we actually grew those to take it to the market. Um, and we grew a lot of other stuff that we ate. Uh, we also, um, uh, when I was fairly young, we also uh, ran a, a small dairy, um, and not a mechanized dairy. We had to, in fact, milk the cows by hand. Uh, later on, uh, when my older brother left home, uh, my dad decided to, um, to mechanize a little bit, and we bought one electric milkle. <laughs> but for the most part, it was still milking by hand. Um, so that's uh, some early, early years um, uh, during my childhood in terms of growing up. So I know what hard work is like. You know, it's interesting, you know, you, you, you grew up on a farm and you go to a school with two rooms from first to sixth grade. Uh, that's the school life from first to sixth. And then you get into, uh, and after sixth grade, you go to another all black school. Um, um, but during that period of time, you know, you, you work, I mean, uh, and what, I mean, many days, even in high school, uh, for a reporting period, I was actually out of school more than in school. Now back to your question, you know, so I, I really did not have time to think about activists with, at that period of time, but I, I, I know for a fact that uh, I was being developed. Here's the example, for an example, um, I, even during those years, I was, we were active in the 4-H. <laughs> I mean, so there's some speaking skills and interacting and learning leadership kinds of things that it afforded me. And in terms of my dad, um, you know, we were involved because we own our own land. I couldn't understand this at the time, right? Uh, but later it finally got in. We own our own land, which meant that we could do things that the neighbors couldn't do. My dad could keep us out of school when we boycotted to school. I mean, I couldn't understand why, as a little young kid, why, why we, get, we can stay out of school and the dead one's up the street, the kids stay out of school. My dad said, well, reflecting back, dad said, well, you know, if they stay out of school, they gotta find another place to live. It didn't really sink deep into me at that point, you know? But, you know, looking back on that, it's very clear that had the Detman family decide to stay out of school, boycott the schools, the white landowner would have said, who were leading the anti-movement against us, would have said, you gotta get up out of here and go.
I'm, I've always been one that liked to save money, right? So I had sent some bonds home and saved a little money. And by the time I got back, I said, you know, I can't just sit around here. I've got to find work to do. Decided not to instantly go back to Raleigh. So it was during the summer. And um, the pickle plant up in Henderson, North Carolina, um, they were hiring for the summer. And uh, so I put on my little Sunday britches, as they call me, to go up to get a job. And I get there, and the guy said, you ready to go to work now? And I'm like, looking, oh, well, OK, I can buy some more pants. Uh, yeah, let's go to work. And so I went to work at that pickle plant. Um, and why at the pickle plant, six months, maybe a year, a little less, um, the United, old meat cutters unions started a campaign there to organize that plant. Um, and uh, what a leader, not the, the leader in the plant, but active in terms of the organizing effort uh, involved in it, you know, able to talk to workers and using my, both my civil rights experience and, and uh, church experience to talk to folks about a union. And let me be honest with you, uh, other than during that period of time, Having my brother, the one who had passed away, the second, not my oldest, my second, he passed away eventually um, after he retired with a good pension union pension plan. But he actually worked in a union plan. And so that was the only connection that I really had and knew anything about a union. He never taught that in high school or, uh, 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 or in school at all. I mean, about unions. Anything you hear is, it had to be pretty negative. But my brother worked at a glass plant in Henderson. And oftentimes when I had to go to the pickle plant, he would say, hey, bro, where you going? I'm going to work. There's a holiday. Holiday for you, but it's not for me. Hey, where you going? Uh, vacation. Wait, why would you like? Well, you know, you get one week's vacation. You get paid for your vacation after you come back. This is your brother. My, yeah, my brother had a union, though. I mean, he's teasing me. Where you going? Oh, man, you got to, you need a, there's a holiday. Yeah, a holiday for you, but I got a, you're in a union job. I'm not in a union job, right? We organized the pickup plant, the workers guy. We negotiated our first contract. And in that contract, we had paid holidays, which the company we'd never heard of, right? Paid, paid holidays. Bullock, James Bullock, who was one of my riders, could not understand the concept of paid Holiday. I mean, he's an old timer. Bless his heart. Well, I mean, I, I don't understand. A paid holiday. I said, James, this is how paid holidays work. When you get up, get your gun, go hunting all day, and the company's gonna pay you to hunt. That's a paid holiday. You do what you want to do, and the company pay you for that day's of work, but you're not working. Oh. So what happens when workers form unions? Although there was all kinds of stuff in the way. I mean, company coming to me, you're a smart young man, you look like good leadership, you know, almost everybody's gonna be the big supervisor, you know, divide and conquer game. We went through all of that. But the workers at the plant had an African-American, supposed to be somebody who came into the plant, y'all shouldn't form a union. The company put this plan here for y'all to have a job. But thank God for Spotwell Burwell, president of the NAACP. He came in and he would talk to our workers when we get together a meeting. He said, how in the world can folks like this saying about a union in heaven and, and don't even want a union at the pickle plant? How can you have a union in heaven if, you, if you're fighting against a union at the pickle plant? So we, again, backing up, we formed our union, we organized, we negotiated our first contract, and it was after that point, that first agreement, that I become, became more active in the union and ultimately became president of the workers at Perfect Pack. This was an amalgamated local, statewide local. But unlike other shops in the local, we elected officers in our own, it was sub, you know, I'm president of the organized workers at Perfect Pack so that we could have our own meetings and we can do our own work. Although the local was based in Asheville, the structure of the local, statewide local, they had its own president, treasurer, and the whole bit. But 
we decided that we need leadership here. The first I was shop steward, chief shop steward, and then became uh, president of the organized workers that kind of managed the business of the, low, of the unit, just that unit of pickle, but at the pickle plant. The plant was a uh, independent brand and then was bought out by H. Hines, the ketchup company, and ultimately closed down um, after some time. The A. Philip Randolph National Office uh, talked to the president of the Federation and said, you know, we can make this happen for you uh, in terms of African-American-owned staff. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the then president, Wilbur Harvey, said, let's, let's talk, let's make this work. And so it was not a big grant. They grant put $5,000 in because the A. Philip Randolph Institute at the time was thinking about how do we start developing new leaders, African-American leaders, uh, train them, and sort of internship program. You know, young, among trade union folks, black, African, black, black trade union people so that they can take leadership in their union and become staff. And so, in fact, um, there were several of us that, uh, I was one of their first. $5,000 to the state fed, state fed said with this $5,000 I will put on uh, uh, this, we got a person that had gone through the front lash stuff and he looked like he got some energy down in Warren County, so they called me and said, come, I want to make you this offer. And they did. Um, that was in 75. I remember that day well, because my first day on the job, I get a call from home. Your second baby is being born. You better get out of there. <laughs> March 25th, right? That was my first full day on the job. I uh, dashed out to see this young daughter of mine, the second baby of mine born. So yeah, that's how I got involved. Um, but again, my job was outreach director. What did I do as outreach director? I reached, I'm, I'm, I was community organizer. And so it was not uncommon for me to be at state NAACP with Charles McLean and other folks who were doing that, those, that kind of work. And then following that with, with uh, Carolyn Coleman, who's now on the national board of the NAACP, when she was serving as executive director of the NAA, state NAACP to, here in the state not uncommon for me to be in community meetings, carrying labor's message, but bringing labor's message back. But also organized, you know, a lot of, we had 12 A. Philip Randolph active chapters across the state at the time, and, and places like Morganton, uh, New Bern, that was a one of Rapids, um, which is still exists, one in Ronald Rapids, um, Nash, Edgecombe, Wilson County combined, new, we used to call it. So we organized those um, local A. Philip Randolph chapters. The job was also to do voter registration, nonpartisan voter registration, get out the vote, but also being the link between the labor movement and the black community. So that piece took off. Uh, if you look at my friend Bennett Taylor, I've been known, I knew him when he was a young guy in the plan. He's retired now, uh, president of the NAACP in his community. He learned skills through the A. Philip Randolph Institute. He headed the A. Philip Randolph chapter on that. So he learned skills and he's now leading the NAACP in Northampton County. Still a very close and dear friend of mine. Start, I met him in the plan as a worker in the plant. Formed the union became president of his local union, active in his Masonic large group, learned those skills, and so that's one positive. The other one I would bring to mind is the whole uh, Canon Neal Piltex, and I've got a special reason to be fond of Piltex uh, uh, Pilte and Canon Neal's, and that is that I married a woman out of there. Uh, didn't know, I didn't know her during that period of time during the organizing campaign, but eventually I married a young lady out of the Virginia plant. But again, years, years in the making, struggle, campaign after campaign, and our involvement, uh, support from the F state FLCIO to the campaign, what does it mean to workers when they are able to look at their employer across the table in contract negotiations and say that, for the first time on, on equal footing with you. I can look, not just trembling, I can look, because the law gives me a right to sit here and negotiate, I can look across the table with you, I can debate with you on what's fair and just and, 
in, in, in the workplace. I can talk to you and, and we can, if you want to, we can work together to make this product the best product and get it to the market on a timely way. And you're making money, but as you make money, you got to share it with the rest of us. That's power. That's a tremendous power. Produced by Duke University.